In this toxicity-themed video, we're going to take a look at two topics, 8.12 and 8.13, lethal dose 50% or LD50, and dose response curve. The large number of naturally occurring and human-produced chemicals found in the environment poses questions about the potential effects they have on humans and other organisms. As we have previously learned, particulates, VOCs, heavy metals, endocrine disruptors, pesticides, and more all carry with them the potential to cause injury, exacerbate pre-existing conditions, or even lead to death. To assess the risk a chemical poses to any organism, scientists need to determine the concentrations that can cause harm. We study not only the ingredients in the products, but those which are used to manufacture their packaging as well. The potency of a particular substance and the harm that it can cause is influenced by the duration of an organism's exposure to it, how long they last in the environment before decomposing into less harmful substances, and how long it takes for the organism to metabolize it and eliminate it from its body. Before we explore how the toxicity of a substance is determined, let's first take a look at how its presence in the environment is quantified. We are all familiar with fractional units, such as percent. 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen gas. That means that out of every 100 gas particles in the atmosphere, 78 of them are nitrogen gas. But when it comes to pollutants and toxins and the concentrations that they're found in the environment, they're generally too low to use a unit as large as percent, which is part per 100. Instead, we use units such as parts per million, parts per billion, and even parts per trillion. Like the previous atmospheric particle examples, these fractional units are used in the same way. If you had $1 million bills and 12 of them were counterfeit, you would have a counterfeit concentration of 12 parts per million. It takes 1,000 parts per million to equal one part per billion, and 1,000 parts per billion to equal one part per trillion. Numbers on the scale of billions and trillions can be difficult to conceptualize. Here's a bit of mind-blowing perspective on these units using a comparison. One million seconds is equal to about 11 days. 11 days is easy for us to wrap our brain around. It's a week and a half. A billion seconds is about 31 years. Quite a jump in time for just adding three more zeros. But still, three decades is a reasonably perceivable amount of time. Adding three more zeros to a trillion seconds is nearly 32,000 years. So for units like these that we use to report on the concentration of toxins in the environment, it is important to keep this perspective of scale in mind. When a toxin is present in an organism's environment, there are different ways in which that organism may interact with it. And while not all toxins are equally dangerous, generally the mode by which an organism is exposed is determinative in how much harm is caused. The first and typically least dangerous is contact. This occurs when there's direct physical contact between a toxin or contaminated surface and the organism's outer surface, such as skin or scales, comes in contact with it. Depending on the duration of contact, the type of toxin, and the concentration of it, effects may range from temporary to permanent damage. Inhalation occurs when an organism breathes in a toxic substance. Examples include harmful irritants such as particulates and VOCs, as well as exposure to aerosolized heavy metals like lead and fibrous minerals like asbestos. But all else being equal, ingestion is generally the most dangerous manner in which organisms are exposed to toxins. When an organism consumes something contaminated with the toxin, it can bioaccumulate in its own body if the rate of ingestion is greater than the rate of removal. When subsequent organisms in a food web consume them, the toxin biomagnifies at progressively higher concentrations at higher trophic levels. 
Unsurprisingly, how long an organism is exposed to a toxin is generally directly proportional to the harm that it causes. Depending on the potency of the toxin, a single short exposure may be sufficient to have severe consequences. For others, repeated exposures are necessary for the harmful effects to manifest themselves. How often and for how long toxin exposure occurs falls into a few broad categories. Acute exposure refers to an event that is short and typically singular in character. For acutely toxic chemicals, an exposure like this is all it takes to cause critical injury or even death. Chronic exposure refers to a relatively longer term and repeated interaction with a toxin. This may mean that multiple exposures are required in order for the harmful effects of the toxin to cause damaging effects. A sort of an in-between exposure category is called subchronic. This is marked by repeated exposures, like the chronic category, but over a short period of time, like the acute category. Dose response studies most commonly use animals as test subjects to measure the effects of exposure to a substance. Commonly used laboratory animals include mice and rats, rabbits, fish when testing toxins found in aquatic environments, as well as a variety of invertebrates. Studies like these usually measure mortality as a response, but not all dose response experiments use death as the measurement gauge. In many cases, scientists are interested in other harmful but sublethal effects. A helpful measurement for comparing the harmful effects of different chemicals is the LD50 value. The LD in LD50 stands for lethal dose. This is a measure of the dose of a compound required to kill 50% of a test population of animals. For example, if scientists wanted to determine the toxicity of a chemical compound X, they would expose a test population of animals to increasing concentrations of the chemical. As dosage increases, so does mortality. In this diagram, we can observe that the starting test population is reduced by half when the dosage has reached right around 30 milligrams per kilogram. The data collected in these experiments are plotted on a dose response curve. At 50% mortality, the dotted line indicates an LD50 value on this chart of approximately 5.5 of those hypothetical units. At this point here, just below three dose units, the harmful effects of the substance are just beginning to cause mortality in the test population. This is referred to as threshold. Toxicity is reported as a unit of the substance, like milligrams or micrograms, per mass unit. In this way, the toxicity of different substances can be compared. For compound Y, in this example, the LD50 value is around 10 milligrams per kilogram, making it much more dangerous than compound X. This means that toxicity and LD50 values are inversely proportional. For dose response experiments that measure the sublethal effects of a substance, rather than LD50, ED50 is used instead. The E stands for effect and represents the dosage required to trigger a sublethal effect in 50% of a test population. Commonly studied sublethal effects include carcinogenicity, the ability of a substance to cause cancer, teratogenicity, the ability of a substance to cause birth defects, and mutagenicity, the ability of a substance to cause mutations to DNA. Although you will never be expected to have memorized the LD50 values for any substances, it is nice to be able to put some of them into perspective, including ones that you're probably exposed to every day. Water and table sugar have relatively high LD50 values. It would take quite a bit of these to cause mortality. Alcohol, on the other hand, is significantly more toxic, but not nearly as toxic as caffeine is. Diphenhydramine hydrochloride, the active ingredient in Benadryl, is slightly more toxic than caffeine, but not nearly as dangerous 
as nicotine found in cigarettes and vaping juice. Hopefully, because of the substantial toxicity of its venom, you never have the misfortune of being bitten by a black widow. But hands down, nearly universally agreed upon, botulinum toxin is the most toxic substance known with an LD50 of 1 to 2 nanograms per kilogram. One thing that is important to remember is that any substance, if an organism is exposed to enough of it, can be fatal. A common saying in toxicology, the dose makes the poison, conveys the idea that concluding how dangerous a chemical is requires knowing how much of it or in what concentration there is. In your daily life, no doubt you have come across warning labels whose job it is to identify the potential danger of a product or its ingredients. In many countries and jurisdictions, including the United States, products often carry legally mandated labeling to educate consumers of potential harms. Terms like danger, warning, and caution are used not arbitrarily, but to specify a particular range of toxicity. The term caution is used to identify substances that have an LD50 of greater than 500 milligrams per kilogram. You may be thinking, didn't I just see that both caffeine and Benadryl have an LD50 that are much less than 500 milligrams per kilogram? Why don't coffee and tea and allergy medicine come with this particular kind of warning label? First, substances that are meant to be ingested rarely carry these kinds of warnings. Second, a person's exposure to toxicity when drinking a cup of coffee or taking an allergy pill is much lower than the LD50s of the substances. Warning, which sounds even more serious than caution, is the next level of labeling. These are substances that have an LD50 of greater than 50 milligrams per kilogram, but less than 500 milligrams per kilogram. And finally, the scariest sounding of the terms is danger, which is often accompanied by the term poison. These substances have an LD50 of less than 50 milligrams per kilogram. Acutely toxic chemicals, such as those that will be fatal if they come in contact with skin, are inhaled, or swallowed, also include the skull and crossbones icon with the term poison. And that is the conclusion for this video. I appreciate you watching. Take care.